the previous segment we discussed what capitalism is, how it became a kind of religion, and why it is so closely linked to the development of science. In this segment, I would like to explore the complex relationship between capitalism and the modern European empires. Now it should be understood that credit and capitalism were not unique European inventions. In early modern China, India, and the Muslim world, there were quite a few merchants and bankers who also thought along capitalist lines. However, the kings and generals in the palaces and forts of Asia tended to despise merchants and their mercantile way of thinking. Most non-European empires of the early modern era financed their wars and activities by taxing their subjects and plundering the enemy. And they owed little to credit systems and they cared little about the interests of bankers and investors. In Europe, on the other hand, kings and generals generally and gradually adopted the capitalist way of thinking until kings and generals moved aside and merchants and bankers became the ruling elite in politics as well as economics. The European conquest of the world was increasingly financed through credit and not through taxation. And it was increasingly directed by capitalists whose main ambition was to receive maximum returns on their investments. The empires built by bankers and investors managed to defeat the empires built by kings and noblemen because they had a much stronger financial base. It's better and easier to finance an empire from investments than from taxation. Because nobody wants to pay taxes, but everybody are very happy to invest. England, France, Spain, and the Netherlands were much poorer and smaller countries than China, India, or the Ottoman Empire. But they financed the conquest of empire not with taxation, like the Chinese, they financed it with credit. European conquerors took loans from banks and from investors in order to buy ships, cannons, and to pay soldiers. They used these ships and soldiers and cannons to explore the world and to conquer new colonies. And profits from the new trade routes and from the new colonies enabled them to repay the loans and thereby build trust and receive more credit next time. Thanks to this trust, uh, the credit that the Europeans could gain just grew more and more over the centuries, and this fueled the growth of empires. Another major difference between the European empires and the Chinese or Ottoman Empire was that the European empires were created and run not by states and governments. To a very large extent, empires like the English or the French or the Dutch Empire were created and managed by private businesses, or more accurately, by limited liability companies. You remember these limited liability companies probably from the second lesson about Peugeot Company. Well, the early modern age was the era in which the limited liability company rose to power and became a central player in history. Because exploring unfamiliar oceans and conquering new colonies was a very risky affair, few people wanted to take the risks only on themselves. So the Europeans created limited liability companies and spread the risk of building empire between many investors. If you wanted to explore the Pacific Ocean or to conquer a new colony in America, what you did is to set up a company. The company then sold shares in the stock exchange to investors. And in such a way, the company collected money 
from a large number of investors, each of whom risked only a small portion of his capital. And there was no need to tax anybody in order to do it. The stock exchange could finance campaigns of exploration and conquest far more easily and efficiently than any kingdom or empire that taxed its subjects. And this is how even very small European nations like England or the Netherlands could build giant empires much bigger than the Ottoman or the Chinese Empire. The Dutch Empire, for example, was built not by the Dutch state, but by Dutch private companies. The most famous Dutch company was called in Dutch the Vereinigde Ostindische Company, or for short, VOC, V-O-C. And it was established in 1602. VOC got money by selling shares in the Amsterdam Stock Exchange and used the money it got for, from selling shares to build ships and send them to Asia and bring back Chinese and Indian and Indonesian goods and sell them in Europe. Later on, VOC began using the money to finance military actions against competitors and against pirates, which threatened the trade routes. Eventually, Vok money financed the conquest, the military conquest of Indonesia. Indonesia is the largest archipelago of islands in the world. It has thousands upon thousands of islands, which in the early 17th century were ruled by hundreds of different kingdoms and principalities and sultanates and tribes. When Vok merchants from the Netherlands first arrived in Indonesia in 1603, their aims were at first just commercial. However, in order to secure their commercial interests and to maximize the profits of the shareholders, Vok merchants began to fight, to fight wars against local rulers who charged too much money in, in, in tariffs as well as to fight against pirates and competitors. Vok armed its merchant ships with cannons. It recruited European and Japanese and Indian and Indonesian mercenaries. And it built forts and conducted full-scale battles and sieges and military campaigns. Back in the early modern period in the 17th century, it was acceptable for a private company to have armies and wage private wars. Vok, over the years, conquered island after island until eventually it conquered almost the whole of Indonesia and it ruled Indonesia, a private company ruled Indonesia with millions of peoples in it for close to 200 years. Only in 1800, the Dutch state assumed control of Indonesia and made it a national colony of the Dutch state, not a colony of a private company. Today, some people warn that corporations in the 21st century are accumulating too much power. Early modern history shows just how far that can go. Businesses back then could actually have armies and fight wars and build empires. And not, not just Vok. While Vok was operating in the Indian Ocean, another famous Dutch company, the Dutch West Indies Company, was operating in the Atlantic Ocean. In order to control trade on the important Hudson River in North America, this Dutch company built a settlement on the exit, on the, on the uh, entry of the Hudson River, and it called it New Amsterdam. The colony, New Amsterdam, was threatened by Indians and also was repeatedly attacked by the commercial rivals of the Dutch, the British. And eventually, in 1664, the British managed to capture New Amsterdam. And then they changed its name from New Amsterdam to New York. The remains of the wall 
that the Dutch company built to defend its colony against the British and the Indians are today paved over by the most famous street in the world. It's called Wall Street. After the wall that defended this colony of the Dutch uh, company against its enemies. The British too built their empire largely with the help of private companies that raised money in the London Stock Exchange. The first British settlements in North America were established in the early 17th century by companies such as the London Company, the Plymouth Company, the Dorchester Company, and the Massachusetts Company, not by the state. Even the British conquest of India was in fact the work of a private company, not the work of the British state. This company was the famous British East India Company. From its headquarters in Lidenhall Street in London, the British East India Company ruled a giant Indian empire for about a century. It maintained a huge military force of about 350,000 soldiers. The army of this company was much bigger than the army of the British state. Only in 1858, the British crown nationalized India and along with the company's private army and made India and the Indian army a possession of the British crown of the, of the, of the state. The nationalization of Indonesia by the Dutch state in 1800 and the nationalization of India by the British crown hardly ended the relationship, the close relationship between capitalism and empire. On the contrary, in the 19th century, the link between capitalism and the European empires grew even stronger. The reason why the private companies no longer needed to establish and govern private colonies and could allow the government to nationalize these colonies is because in the 19th century, the managers and the stockholders of the companies now control the governments in London and Amsterdam and Paris. So once they controlled the state, they could allow the state to do the hard work for them. They could now count on the state to look after their interests. Karl Marx famously said that Western governments, at least in the 19th century, were actually the trade union of the capitalists. Just as uh, shoemakers have a trade union of shoemakers and say uh, dock workers in the port have a trade union of the dock workers so the big capitalists also they have a trade union and the name of their trade union is the government. The government looks after the interests of the big capitalists. The most notorious example of how in the 19th century governments were controlled by the capitalists and looked after their interest is the famous opium war fought between Britain and China in the early 1840s. In the, in the first half of the 19th century, the British East India Company and other in, uh, British business people made huge fortunes by exporting drugs, particularly opium, to China. During this period, millions of Chinese became opium addicts and this harmed the country, China, both economically and socially. So in the 1830s, the Chinese government uh, made drug trafficking illegal. It forbade to, to, to continue uh, trafficking in drugs. However, the British drug merchants, like the British East India Company, simply ignored the Chinese law and continued to export opium and other drugs to China. The Chinese authorities didn't like it, and they began to confiscate and destroy the drug cargoes. But the drug cartels, the drug companies, had very close connections in the British government. Many members of parliament and many cabinet ministers in London held stocks in the drug companies or were managers of the drug companies like the British East India Company. So they pressured the government to take action against the Chinese. In 
In, 18, in 1840, Britain declared war on China in the name of free trade. The British argued that the Chinese are interrupting in the free trade of the, of the drug dealers, and this is not right, so they declared war on China in order to safeguard free trade, and they invaded China. And the British won a very easy and decisive victory over the Chinese. The Chinese were extremely confident of themselves, but they had no answer to the new miracle weapons of the British. The British in the middle of the 19th century, they now had heavy artillery, steamboats, rockets, rapid firing rifles, and the Chinese had no answer to it, and they were defeated completely. In the peace treaty that ended the Opium War, China agreed not to uh, constrain the activities of British drug merchants and also to compensate the drug dealers for the damages that were inflicted pre prior to the, to the war by the Chinese police. Also, the British demanded and received control of the port of Hong Kong, which they now used as a secure base from which to sell opium and other stuff in China. In the late 19th century, it is estimated that about 40 million Chinese 10% of the population were opium addicts. Today, uh, this link between capitalist and credit and politics and government is still very, very close. We see it, for example, in the fact that the success of a country today in the world depends much more on its credit rating than on its natural resources. Credit ratings indicate the probability that a country will pay its, de its debts. In addition to purely economic data, when you calculate the credit uh, rate of a country, you also take into consideration the political situation, the cultural factors, social factors, and so forth. For example, in, in a country which is rich in oil, but has a despotic government, and suffers from, say, a lot of crime and a corrupt judicial system, will usually receive a very low credit rating. Because it has a low credit rating, it will be hard for this country to borrow money. And if it borrows money, the interest will be high. Because it can't uh, borrow money easily, it will be difficult for this country to develop its oil fields and it will probably remain a poor country. Even though it is rich in resources, because it has poor credit ratings and cannot borrow money, it will remain poor. On the other hand, a country which has no natural resources, but it has peace and a good judicial system and a free government, is likely to receive high credit ratings. This means that it will be able to borrow money cheaply. And this can be used, this capital, this credit can be used to develop a good education system and, for example, to develop a flourishing high-tech industry. So simply by having good credit ratings, a country poor in resources can become very rich and prosperous. And many of the countries today in the world, which are the richest countries, they don't have many resources, many natural resources. Since capital and politics influence each other to such an extent, how the relations should be is a matter for very heated debates both among economists and also among uh, politicians and the general public. One of the main issues today in politics is how exactly to manage the relations between the political system and the uh, capitalist system of credits and banks and, and the stock exchange and so forth. People who are called capitalists usually tend to think that capital should be free to influence politics, but not vice versa. Politics should not interfere in the world of banks and capital and credit and so forth. Such people who believe in the freedom of the markets, they usually argue 
that when you allow political interests to influence the economy too much, the result is unwise economic decisions and slower economic growth. For example, governments tend to impose heavy taxation on industrialists and capitalists and use the money to give unemployment benefits to the poor, which is very popular with the voters. But in view of many business people who believe in free markets, it would have been much better if the government kept taxes low and left the money with the industrialists. Because then the industrialists could use this money to open new factories and hire the unemployed, which is much better than giving them unemployment benefits. In this view, the wisest economic policy is to keep politics out of the economy, to reduce taxation and government regulation to a minimum, and simply to allow the forces of the free market to take their course. It is argued that private investors, when they are not influenced by political considerations, will always know to invest their money where they can get the most profit, and in this way it ensures the fastest economic growth possible. And fast economic growth will benefit everybody. Obviously the investors and the, and, the, and the rich people, but also the workers and the government and even the unemployed. So the believers in capitalism and, and free market, they tend to advise government to do as little as possible. Just do nothing and let the markets uh, make the wisest decisions by themselves. This doctrine of the free market, the freedom of markets as a, as, as a top value is today the most common and most important variant of the capitalist religion. The most enthusiastic advocates of the free markets criticize almost everything governments do, whether it's wars outside or welfare programs at home they always tell government that they must simply do as little as possible and the markets will take care of the rest. This view, however, of the economy suffers from several very serious problems and when taken to extreme, it has caused over the last few centuries terrible calamities. The problem of this belief in the free market and the calamities that it had caused will be discussed in the next segment.